Hello friends and welcome back to my channel. I'm Lydia, the Halfling Seamstress, and it's time we addressed the layer cake in the room. This poofy floofy dress has sat in the background of pretty much all my videos so far, without acknowledgement. And at the end of August, I had the utmost pleasure of attending Fan Expo Canada for the first time in over three years, and the layer cake dress made her convention debut. So I thought it was high time I did a video showing just how I made Kaylee's layer cake dress. For anyone who hasn't seen the cult classic TV show Firefly, meet Kaylee Fry, ship's mechanic and lover of strawberries and floofy dresses. In the episode Shindig, she and the captain have to go undercover to the most swankified party in the town, and she gets to wear this poofy layer cake of a dress. After Fan Expo Canada 2018, I decided that I wanted to make a big head-turning cosplay, and of all the epic dresses on screen, this felt like the one that was most reasonably within my skill level at the time. Timeline-wise, I started this on March 6th, 2019, which is the day my hoop skirt arrived, and finished it on July 31st, 2020. Now this was not a year and a half of straight sewing, there was a lot of downtime when I was looking for fabrics or patterns or fitting mock-ups. If I was sewing straight through, 8 hours a day, 5 days a week, it would probably be about a month's worth or 160 hours of labor. Ish. Now the upside to making a more niche cosplay like this is that you aren't confined to a set this is how it must be look. There is room for interpretation and freedom to use variations in fabric. The downside to making a more niche cosplay like this is that there is a lot less research available compared to more mainstream cosplays. In doing research, I came across maybe 20 individual Shindig Kaylee cosplayers, as opposed to dozens of everyday engineer Kayleys. Of the maybe 20, maybe a quarter of them had tutorials slash construction guides. Of those five-ish, only two gave me the end result I was looking for. So, enough backstory, let's get into the analysis of a layer cake. This is one of the very few parts of the costume I did not make, as I had zero clue how to make a hoop skirt. In the immortal words of Weird Al Yankovic, I bought it on eBay for approximately $25. In the show, the costume department rented a hoop skirt from a production of The King and I. Thanks to another cosplayer doing the mathing, we know this skirt is as wide as Jewel State is tall, which makes figuring out your own personal hoop skirt ratio super duper easy. I am five foot nothing, and so I was looking for a five foot or 120 inch hoop skirt. This one was the most appealing as it has built in floof. The first alteration I made was adding a pair of hooks and eyes at the waist. When I tried it on by itself, the velcro and ties held no problem. However, once I got all the layers on, the combined weight meant they did not hold well at all. So, presto! One pair of hooks and eyes, and we are golden. I did make another kind of two-part change, and the first part I literally made on the fly in the cosplay repair booth at Fan Expo. I did not realize how much longer the lowest ruffle was compared to the hems and petticoat of the skirt and as I walked, it would slide under the skirt, and I kept stepping on it and tripping. So I grabbed a pair of scissors and seam ripped off the lowest layer of tulle. I also safety pinned up the hem of the hoop skirt since that was a little too long too. Once at home, I hemmed it up properly, so knock on wood, there shouldn't be any more tripping issues in the future. I found a fantastic tutorial by Caitlin's Costume Closet, who walked through her construction process in great detail, and I used it for the petticoat and the skirt. It's made from five trapezoid panels with a split down the back for closure. Then comes lots and 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 lots of ruffles. Each ruffle is seven inches wide, and because there won't be a lot of rubbing on the underside and nobody, except the entire internet now, is going to see it, I did a very lazy hem. I literally just turned it up once and stitched it down. I then gathered all the ruffles and stitched them to the petticoat base. Fun tip! If you are making something with a metric heckin' ton of ruffles, sewing them all down by machine may seem like the faster option, but once you get above the second row, you will be wrangling so much fabric, it will be a literal nightmare. Seriously, just take the time and hand sew it, your sanity will thank you. The skirt itself has eight rows of ruffles, but for the petticoat, I only made five rows of ruffles, since having too much poof 
too far up would make the silhouette at the waist sit wonky. The petticoat closes with a drawstring, which I may replace some point with a lower profile twill tape or ribbon, but overall it does a really good job of holding the petticoat in place. Okay, time for the piece de resistance, the actual layer cake. I used a poly cotton blend in off-white for the base of the skirt. I used the same trapezoid shapes as the petticoat, but I made them longer and wider to accommodate the volume of floof over top of the petticoat. The layers of floof are polyorganza, and let me tell you, polyorganza is a nightmare to work with. It is the cat hair of the fabric world, and its irritating level is only rivaled by glitter. It has been just over two years since I finished construction, and I am still occasionally finding organza threads in this room. The rows of floof I also made slightly wider than the petticoat ruffles to accommodate the increased size of the skirt base. I did a proper hem for these layers since they would be more visible and see-through, plus the fabric frays super duper easily. Being a polyester fabric, it was going to be a challenge, but I ran a line of thread along where I wanted to fold, pressed it over with a low heat iron, low heat iron, and pressed it over again and hemmed it by machine. Then to make the ruffles. This was the first major snag I hit. I gathered up all the layers into a lovely gathered floof, stitched on the first row, started pinning on the second row, and went, uh oh, this is not how it looks on the show. I was super not happy with how the ruffles were sitting at all. So I went back to my research and looked at what other cosplayers had done. I pulled up screen caps from the episode and squinted really hard at my computer screen and realized that all the layers of floof are not gathered ruffles. They are pleated ruffles. This makes for lots of floof, but still an organized streamlined silhouette. This also meant that my entire plan of attack had to change. I undid all the gathering threads in my fabric and set about putting in one inch pleats instead. And I used a hack I saw online where you use a bit of cardboard the width you want your pleats to be, and you end up with perfectly even pleats every single time. This meant I was able to make up my ruffles fairly quickly, until I made a discovery. Um, pleated ruffles take up approximately 50% more fabric than gathered ruffles. I found myself completely out of pink fabric, and I still had a row and a half of skirt that needed ruffling, and I could tell it would be the same for the peach layer. So I made a mad dash for the fabric store I bought them from, crossing every single appendage that the both fabrics would still be there. Thankfully, they were. So between my initial purchase and the emergency purchase, the skirt ruffles used a grand total of eight yards of pink organza, five yards of peach organza, and a yard and a half of white organza. The white organza is so much lower because there are only two rows as opposed to three rows for the other colors. I made up the remaining pleated ruffles and began to stitch them down. The first time I started sewing them down, I left the raw edge up, figuring eh, no one would see it and it would be covered by the next row of ruffles. Then I pinned on the next row of ruffles and realized that you actually could see the raw edge through the ruffles, and it looked tacky. So I undid the first row of stitching and pinned it on the skirt upside down, raw edge pointing downward toward the hem. That way, once the row was done, I could iron the ruffles toward the hem, hiding and protecting the raw edge. I learned my lesson from the petticoat and decided to save my sanity, and so all the ruffles on the skirt I sewed down by hand. It gave me an excuse to binge watch a lot of YouTube, and that was when I discovered historical costuming and folks like Bernadette Banner and Morgan Donner. I initially sewed up the waist as a standard waistband, complete with zipper and hooks and eyes. However, the first time I went to take pictures, I realized that a small calculation error had been made, and there was a gap between where the top row of ruffles ended and the peplum of the bodice began, and it looked stupid. I rolled it up for the pictures, but I knew if I was going to wear it all day at a convention, it needed a permanent fix. I ended up needing to take up about three inches of fabric to make everything sit right, which the skirt being trapezoid shaped meant that once cut, there was a lot of extra fabric at the waist. So going back to a zipper was out of the question, and I figured that if the petticoat could be a drawstring waistband, why couldn't the actual skirt? This actually ended up working out remarkably well, and it stayed in place all day. And it was super easy for any time I needed to escape my rig for the uh, little engineer's room, where wrangling a massive hoop skirt would have been problematic. Speaking of the little engineer's room, to avoid any indecent moments, I wore a pair of shorts under my petticoat and a tank top under my bodice. 
which also made driving to and from the con so much easier. This part took a while, mostly because finding all the components took forever. With the very few tutorials I found online, each and every one used an entirely different pattern to make the bodice. I ended up going with Simplicity 1425 from mine. This pattern has a lace overlay on the front, so technically the front section of the bodice is in two pieces, but I taped the two pieces together to get the singular bodice piece I needed, and that worked perfectly. I made a mock-up for this, and I'm so glad I did, because even though I used the size that should have been correct by their sizing guide, it ended up being almost two sizes too large. Once I took in a whole bunch, I had the correct shape and was ready to go on to actually making the bodice. This was my second big snag, and is the one place where the sewing really came to a screeching halt, because try as I might, I could not find a suitable fabric for this bodice. I looked at both fabric stores in my area, more than once, I looked at pretty much every single thrift store in my area multiple times. I did find a pair of pink curtains that became the sleeves, but no bodice fabric. And so it was 11 o'clock at night and I was whinging to myself, oh, if only I were Bernadette Banner, then I could just pop down to 39th Street and go through the many stores there and find the perfect fabric. Why can't I live in New York? Alas, I don't live anywhere near a major city that might have a garment district. Toronto is only an hour away. I felt delighted and just a little foolish when I did a 10 second Google and discovered that there was indeed a thriving fashion district in downtown Toronto with at least a dozen fabric stores along one single street. Cue the most spontaneous trip I've ever taken. I zipped down to the fashion district, saw more fabric in the four hours I was there than I think I had in my entire life up until that moment and found the perfect overlay for the bodice in the very first shop I walked into. I was a little nervous about having enough since I bought the entire remnant of the bolt and it was just under two yards, but it ended up being plenty of fabric for the bodice and I have a few cabbage pieces left over that I'm waiting to turn into something special. Since I had so little fabric to play with, I wanted to tackle the center front first, since that's the section that uses the most fabric, and I figured if I needed to do some funky piecing with the back, I could. Thankfully, there was no piecing required. The pleating was challenging to figure out, but once I got started, it was fairly straightforward. I measured out the widest part of the center front and cut a long strip of overlay that width. Then I knife pleated upwards, starting at the waistline and continuing until I reached the bottom of the neckline. This was partly because I wanted it to be smooth over the shoulders and partly because that was literally all that was left of the strip of fabric. And I felt like trying to add more at that point would have made things bulky and awkward. Once the pleats were thoroughly pinned in place and looking just a little bit like funfetti with all those colorful pins, I did a quick line of machine stitching all the way around to hold the bare bones in place. Then I began the long process of tacking each individual row of pleating in place by hand. This allows the pleats to maintain their shape while also staying completely in place. Doing this by machine would have compressed the pleats and not given the right look at all. I didn't do a great job of tracking exactly how long it took me to work on this project, but I do know that while pinning and stitching the pleats on the front bodice, I watched through two and a half Broadway shows online. So we're talking somewhere around six hours of work just for this one piece of the bodice. The other pieces of the bodice got flat lined together so that while assembling the bodice, the base and overlay would get treated as one single fabric. I was so grateful for historical costuming videos as I hadn't heard about flat lining before starting this project, but it really was the answer to make this work. Historical costuming also taught me a valuable lesson about seam finishing. We have this idea of historical perfection, that because all our modern seams are completely finished, that historical seams would have been completely finished as well. This is not the case, as you can see in a lot of videos looking at the insides of historical garments. A lot of dresses were made with the presumable logic, if nobody is going to see the seams, we don't need to worry about finishing the seams. There are a lot of historical extants that have completely raw seams, and I will admit I said if it's good enough for the Victorians, it's good enough for me, and most of the seams in the bodice I left completely raw. There were some things that had to go in a specific order. For instance, the lace on the princess seams had to get sewn to one side of the center front before attaching the side pieces. I also did the pink ribbon down the middle and the rows of buttons before putting the bodice together. The pink ribbon at the bottom of the peplum also got attached to the peplum itself before joining to the bodice. I did a quick little try on and was happy with the fit, so then I could go ahead with the sleeves and zipper. I bought a zipper, installed the zipper, 
then tried to put the bodice on and realized I had bought the wrong kind of zipper. I bought the kind that is closed at the bottom, the kind you use for skirts or pants. It does not work well for tailored bodices unless you are a contortionist. So I quickly ran back out to my local fabric store, grabbed the correct kind of zipper, open at both ends like for coats, and got it installed and I was very happy. The sleeves were actually super easy. I used the pattern piece from Butterick Pattern 6630, which Fun fact is the pattern my mom used to make her Jane Cobb Austen cosplay. I added a couple extra inches to the bottom of the pattern to make the little flare, but kept the elastic marking as indicated on the pattern. I did add the macrame fringe to the sleeves before sewing them to the bodice, but after the sleeves were sewn together so I could knot in a round. One tiny detail that is very easy to miss is that Kaylee's fringe isn't just pink. If you look at the behind the scenes pictures, the little tassels actually alternate pink and green. Why? I have no idea but of course I had to add that in. I marked out points half inches apart and threaded strands of pink embroidery floss, and I carefully hid each knot in the seam allowance of the cuffs. Then I took pairs of threads and made double knots all the way around, and for the following rounds I alternated pairs to give the diamond look you see. Then I made little tassels with pink and green embroidery floss and tied them to the lower points of the macrame, securing each one with a little bit of fabric glue. The sleeves got sewn to the bodice, and I did wrangle them through the machine for this. And that's the base of the cosplay. All that was left were the accessories to pull it all together. There is a belt, which I made from the pink organza, pleated up, and fastened with hooks and eyes. One change I'm thinking of making is adding a couple little stays at the sides to help it keep its shape and not fold over quite so much. I also made Kaylee's hair bow myself using some pink satin ribbon and covered in a little bit more of the pink organza. The gloves I found on clearance at either Claire's or Arden, and I honestly can't remember which. The purse and shoes I found at the thrift store, and both were only found earlier in 2022, so in a weird way it was a kind of a good thing that I had the extra time in between finishing the dress and getting to wear it out. And I know that the purse is a bit bigger than the one in the episode. I actually do have a more clutch size purse as well, but conventions don't have buffet tables with hot cheese, so I used this larger one so I could carry my lunch and water bottle. And that is how I put together Kaylee's layer cake dress from the Firefly episode Shindig. It was definitely a massive undertaking and absolutely frustrating at times, but I learned so much from making it, and it was actually the project that gave me the push and the confidence to start a YouTube channel. It was also so much fun to wear. 100% hit my goal of being a head turner cosplay, and everyone's comments and excited squeeze of delight absolutely made my day and made the many, many hours of construction so worthwhile. And for those of you who stuck around to the end of the video, I have to give a special shout out to my favorite and littlest fan interaction of the day. My mom and I were on our way to a specific spot to snap some pictures, and I was stopped by the cutest little girl who was absolutely blown away by Shindig Kaylee. We ended up chatting for about at least 10 minutes about everything from the many, many layers of floof on my skirt to comparing who had the cooler shoes. Hers has Anna and Elsa, so I think she's got me beat on that one, to school starting soon to how busy and exciting the con was. And of course, both of us having twirly skirts, we had to twirl around several times. And as we were about to head out, she said, when well, I am a grown up just like you, I'm going to wear this dress just like you and have shiny shoes just like you and a pink purse just like you and a hair bow just like you. You're my favorite. Y'all, I melted. The kid was wearing Anna and Elsa shoes and I'm her favorite. So that is my I'm a princess moment, and even though I'm sure she had no idea who I was cosplaying, it's sweet to know that Kaylee is inspiring even the smallest of princesses to dress up.